Romans chapter 4 this week. Last week we dealt a little bit with this. I couldn't get it off my mind, off my heart all week. And so we kind of going to pick up where we left off last week. But uh, end of Romans chapter number 4, beginning down about verse number 16. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome starts talking about the importance of faith. Then he jumps into an example, that being his father after his Hebrew heritage, Abraham. Then we get down to verse number 21. And it says, And being fully persuaded, talking about Abraham, and being fully persuaded that he who had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. In chapter number 5, verse number 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, by way of introduction, i got to get you all on the same page that I've been thinking on all week. So i got to get you all caught up on six days worth of Jordan thinking to himself with the Holy Ghost in about five minutes. So buckle in. Right? Abraham. Okay, one of the patriarchs. Okay, go study the history of your Bible. The patriarchs lived long before Moses did. Okay, go read Matthew chapter number 1. Read the lineage of Christ. Okay, you're going to find out Moses was a whole lot further down the line than Abraham was. Okay, uh, you go back even further than that, you're going to find a guy named Noah. Okay, history in the Bible is laid out the way that it is for an important reason. We mentioned this last week also. First five books of what we today call the Bible, what the Hebrews called, you know, their testament, okay, the Pentateuch, right? The guy who wrote that, his name was Moses, okay? Moses was raised in Egypt when Israel was in bondage in Egypt. That happened after Israel's sons went into Egypt, brought Jacob, their father, with them. Okay, our pastor preached on that not too long ago. Right, then... They have generations and 400 years of kids, and Moses was one of them. Okay? Abraham, if we started Israel, who was Jacob, he had a dad named Isaac, and guess who Isaac's dad was? Abraham. Abraham didn't live with a Bible in his back pocket. Hadn't been written yet. Right? Not even the whole council of the Word of God like we have. Right? Abraham. Go, go read it in the book of Genesis if you think I'm lying to you. Guess how many times God had to tell Abraham to get up out of his homeland and become a nomad? Once. Guess how many times God had to tell Abraham that he was going to have a son, not through the maidservant of his wife, but through Sarah? Now, at first he's a little curious, Lord, how are you going to do that? We're both way old in years. But God said, I'm going to do it. He said, okay. Guess how many times God told him after that that Sarah was going to have a kid? He heard it one time. How many times do you think uh, God told Abraham to take Isaac up on the mountain and sacrifice him? Once. Okay, let's, let's go back a little bit further. I mentioned him, Noah. Took Noah 120 years to build an ark. The whole time he's preaching that God's going to send judgment. There's room on the ark. Get on the ark. Everybody else, what's an ark? Why are you building an ark? It's never rained. What is rain? Right, but you go study. God was very detailed in his instructions on how long the ark was supposed to be, how wide the ark was supposed to be, how the ark was supposed to be prepared. It was supposed to be pitched on the inside and on the outside. It was supposed to have a cover with the window in the top of it. All those details. Guess how many times Noah heard it? Once. And Noah lived off of it, not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, but for 120 years. To put that in context, if we went back 120 years, World War I hadn't happened yet.
And Noah went that long on one time that God gave him instruction. But we're talking about powerful faith, right? That's what the Apostle Paul's talking about in this passage. He's saying Abraham had a lot of faith. But see, his faith goes on. Verse number 22. Therefore, uh, let's go back to 21. And being fully persuaded. What kind of faith did Abraham have? He was fully persuaded. If you're fully persuaded, you know what that means? Nobody can convince you otherwise. You can't convince yourself otherwise. The world can't convince you. Satan himself couldn't convince you otherwise. If God came down and told you that he was going to break a promise that he made to you, you wouldn't believe that because God can't lie in the first place. You are fully persuaded. And because he was fully persuaded, verse number 21 said, he wasn't fully persuaded that he was able to do what God wanted him to do. Go look at Moses. God started talking to him out of a burning bush that was on fire but not consumed. He couldn't wrap his head around that. Let alone when he said, who am I talking to? And he said, I am that I am. And then Moses, he about fell down like a dead man. Okay, he had to take his shoes off. He got so close to God. Right? Well, Moses gave a lot of excuses on why he couldn't. But you'll never find that Moses doubted that God could do it. He said he couldn't go before Pharaoh because he wasn't strong in speech. He had a speech problem. He said, let me take Aaron with me. Aaron never said a thing. Only time we find Aaron saying something is when he made that golden calf for the people of Israel and caused a whole big mess. Aaron should have shut up and stayed shut up. But you find a lot of times where Moses says, Lord, I don't know how these people... Right? He came down off the mountain. Moses wanted to kill him after he just tried to tell God, Lord, you promised you was going to take him out of Israel. What would everybody else think if you brought him out just to kill him in the wilderness? Then he gets down the mountain. He wants to kill him. Right? He says, Lord, I think you might have been justified in that. But who was he doubting? He wasn't doubting God. He was doubting the people. Saying, Lord, they're stiff, stiff neck, uncircumcised of heart. You just parted the Red Sea and they're already doubting if you can feed them. Never do you find that Moses doubted that God could do it. What did Abraham believe? That God was able to do what God promised. Abraham wasn't fully persuaded that he was enough. Abraham wasn't fully persuaded that Sarah was enough in her elder age to bear a child. Abraham wasn't sure enough that God was going to you know, use him to do a great money. He said he was going to make his descendants numbered like the stars in the sky. Great nations would come out of his lineage. That God's chosen people would come out of his lineage. And Abraham's sitting there, well first it was Abram, and then later God changed his name to Abraham, and the whole while he's thinking, Lord, how are you going to use me to do something like that? But he never doubted that God could do it. Right? Well, as a result of him being fully persuaded that if God promised it, God could do it. Right? Then verse number 22. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. That later on, we find that this is the exact same thing that happened when you believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you were saved. Same process. Different dispensations. We don't have time to get into all that. Right? But Abraham wasn't even under the dispensation of law yet. Law hadn't been given. He's in that dispensation between the Garden of Eden and when God delivered the law. That's the time of the patriarchs. But, Abraham, because he was fully persuaded. This is how much Abraham believed God before God promised he was going to have Isaac. Right before God promised that he was going to make a great nation out of his lineage that they were going to be God's chosen people, that God made a covenant with Abraham that his people were going to be God's chosen people. Okay, long before all that, Abraham, he's an older man, certainly by today's standards, okay, but in that day and age, right, when they lived a whole lot longer, Abraham was still a man that had established an entire life for himself. He was a successful man. Go study how many servants and how many animals and how many, you know, goods he took with him out of his homeland. 
He had built a successful life. And God told him one day to take up the stakes and move on out with no assurances. God just said, go and look for a city that I'm, that I'm building. The book of Hebrews tells us that Abraham believed that he's going to find that city because he was looking for it. And he was looking for a city not made by human hands, but one whose builder and maker was God. He believed it so much that he believed he was going to walk up on a city that God made. And one day he walked out of Abraham's bosom into heaven. One of these days he's going to see it. It's called New Heaven, New Earth, and New Jerusalem. They're going to find that city one of these days. But he's looking for it down here. Convinced that he was going to find it. Because God told him to go and look for it. But how many of you Right with you. Okay, I get it. Right, we all got halos. Okay, let's just take them all off. Okay, how many of you, after one occurrence, now it may have been a burning bush experience, we don't know how God showed up and talked to Noah, we just know that he showed up and talked to Noah. Okay, same thing with Abraham. Right? But off of one conversation, you drop everything that you've spent your entire life working for to go out into something you have no idea how you're going to provide for your wife. You have no idea how you're going to provide for your servants who have pledged themselves to you. Your life, or their life's in your hands. You say, well, where are we going to get water? I don't know. Go study it out. Abraham had to dig a lot of wells. And you know where he dug them? Where God told him to. Abraham had a lot of people. I mean, he had enough people that when Lot was taken captive out of the city of, cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, right, king came in, took Lot captive. You find he had enough boys that knew what to do with the sword that they went out and whooped the army that just took Lot and brought Lot and his family back. Well, how many servants did he have? A bunch. Right, well, how much food on a daily basis did it take to feed them servants? I don't know, but God knew exactly how much it was. That's all Abraham needed to know. Abraham didn't know how much water he needed every day to feed all those people, all those animals. But he knew that God did. Right? Long before he ever heard a story about God telling Moses to raise the staff and tell water to come out of the rock and a great river came out and fed all those millions of people that came out of the land of Egypt plus all the animals that they came out with. Right? Abraham just believed that if God told him to go, there was going to be stuff waiting on him along the way. Guess what there was? Why? Because he was fully persuaded. Verse number 22 says, It was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now that word imputed means, one, it's given and can't be taken back. Okay, most of the time we use that word imputed nowadays and, you know, about for the past 200 years in a negative context. Right, like we impute a sentence upon somebody who was found guilty of a crime. You know what that means? Can't be reversed. Right, once the judge's gavel comes down it's settled unless somebody did something wrong and he's convicted you know improperly that once it's settled it's in the books it can't be changed it's been imputed that is yours to have whether you want it or not you own it and you got to live up to it okay, well it says here that because Abraham believed God being fully persuaded it means he didn't have any doubt. All he had was belief. It was imputed unto him for righteousness. You know what imputed means? God gave him something that didn't belong to him, that Abraham couldn't have obtained on his own, that Abraham had no idea what it was. All he knew is that God was holy and he what? But in time before, he could bow his head before the Lord and ask him to be saved. Right? In a time before the law was given to show exactly all that was wrong, Abraham knew he was a sinner. Right? Why do you think he went out and made so many sacrifices unto God? Because Adam and Eve instilled in their son Seth, like they instilled in their son Abel, that there's only one sacrifice that God will accept, and the reason we have to make it is because we disobeyed God knowingly, and because of sin, now blood's required to cover that sin. That was passed down through the lineage until it got to Abraham. Just like it was passed down through Noah and Enoch before him. Right? And everybody else up until the point that God gave the law. You know what Abraham knew? He wasn't enough and God was. 
And he believed it so much that he lived day by day based off of what God said. And the Bible says that a man who Christ hadn't died and shed his blood for yet, that God hadn't outlined what it took to be holy in the eyes of God, that's what the law was, and that's how we know that we're all sinners because the law is our schoolmaster show us that we were sinners. Right? Abraham, for he knew what God accepted and what God saw as perfection, holiness, he knew he wasn't it. But God, knowing that he was a sinner, knowing that he couldn't be holy and righteous in his own, what did he do? He imputed righteousness unto him. But if you get a judgment in court, don't come to me. I can't help you. But judgment means it's already over. It's been imputed. Can't take it back. Well, you know what happened when God imputed righteousness unto Abraham? Nobody could take it back. Imputed means permanent. But see, not only does it mean that it's given to somebody permanently, it's something that's put upon them. It's what it literally means, to attach something to a person. Right? To make it known so that everybody knows this is a part of that person now. Okay? Well, imputed also means not just to permanently attach. Okay. But in our context, it's saying something that Abraham wasn't even able to hold on to. How can somebody that's not righteous hold on to righteousness? Right? It'd be like giving a toddler a pristine white ball, telling them to go play out in the backyard and getting upset when mud gets all over it. Right? Balls meant to be played with, they're going to get dirty. Okay? They're like giving Chief anything, he's going to eat it doesn't matter what it is that could be a toy could be food could be a piece of furniture chief going to eat it yeah he's going to try his best but see imputed means even though they can't hold on to it in context God said I'll give it to you and I will attach it to you you know what one of, the one that had a little bit of sense okay we don't know you know, which one it was in all the accounts. But one of them Pharisees or Sadducees or scribes that was there at the trial of James and John, I mean Peter and John after they healed that man in the temple, one of them had enough sense to realize that if God does it, no man can undo it. And if God didn't do it, no man can make it happen. But Well, what's that mean in our context? If God gave it to you, you can't get rid of it if you wanted to. It was imputed unto you. That means regardless of what you do from here on, it is attached to you. Okay, now, does that mean we don't have to repent? No. But it means as a result of your faith, fully believing, fully persuaded, without doubt, God took something that was His and permanently attached it to you. Okay, well... Says verse number 23. Not just Abraham. He says, now it was not written for his sake alone. You know what that means? God's still imputing righteousness. Because God's no respect to our persons. God loved Abraham just as much as he loves you. And God doesn't love you any less than he's loved anybody that's ever existed. So if God made a way for Abraham to have righteousness imputed unto him, but don't you think that he'd make a way for you to have righteousness imputed unto you? So, verse number 24, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed. That's a promise. It shall be. You know what that means? It can't not happen. God said it will if. Right? So as long as we do, it will. Okay, well, he goes on to say, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You know what that word justification means? To justify, right, when I was justified, that means in the eyes of God, it's as if I never committed any sin. Justified means not just you paid a debt, but that the debt was forgotten. It never existed in the first place. There's not a record of that, you know, you defaulted on it this many times before you paid it off. No. Bank, they look up the records. We never loaned him any money. But we have 
no record that he ever needed our help. Justified means in the eyes of God, it has always been that you were what one day you will be. The finished perfect act of God in a body that looks like Jesus Christ with him forever settled for all of eternity. Now you said, Brother Jordan, how can that be? I don't know. He's God. Right? Wrapping my head around the fact that once God saved you, he forgot what you were, and he's always looked back through the scope of time. Now he looks back and he sees his son for you from that point, not just when he got saved, from the beginning. The Bible says he knew you before he formed you in the belly. Which means God sees you as Christ from when you started until eternity. He imputed unto you. Means nothing can undo it. You know why we love the story of the prodigal son? Because no matter what the son did, you know what the father imputed unto the son? A place, a title. You know what that title was? Son. No matter what the world did, no matter what he did, you know why he ran and fell upon him when he showed up? Because everybody else was grabbing stones to go and stone him because he deserved to die for what he did. But the father said, you want to kill him, you got to kill me. I imputed unto him a place here at my house. I imputed unto him an apparel. Right? The robe, the ring. Get him out of them worldly clothes. Well, you say, he was still just as dirty. Not in the eyes of the father. In the eyes of the father, it was imputed unto him that that was his son. And that when he was at home, he was the son that he always had been and he always would be. The father forgave him long before he showed up because he remembered what he was and he knew that he could be it again. When he saw him, he didn't see the old... He saw what he would be once he got him cleaned up and back in the house. That, that's what imputed, justified. That you were imputed justification. I mean, nobody can undo that. Now, yes, I understand that we still sin after we get saved, but nobody undoes the fact that God saved you and you'll be saved for forevermore. Nothing can undo the fact that as long as you humbly bow your head, like John wrote in his epistles, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us. You know what that means? He's just imputing more righteousness. But what's more righteous than righteous? I don't know, but God's got all of it. It's not based on our righteousness. No, it's based on the righteousness which was imputed or attached to us. Y'all know them... Like, see dairy cows, they got tags in their ear. You know why they do that? So they can't get rid of it. So that wherever that cow goes, they know that's cow number 86. But everybody that looks at that cow, I'm not a dairy farmer, but I know that's cow number 86 because it's got 86 on its ear. But does the cow have a name? I don't know, but it's 86. But, well, what are you saying? When the world looks at us, if it's been imputed unto you, you know what they should see? something different they may not know what it is may not know what to call it they know they can't separate it from you because everything they throw at you that just stays stuck to you can't get rid of it wherever you go it's always there front and center why because it's been imputed unto you okay, well justification is the same thing no matter what happens in your life when God looks in the book back and go Go read what the devil's been trying to do since the beginning. He's still doing to this day. He's the accuser of the brethren. You know, that means he goes before God and he tells God all the sins that you committed. And that song, well, I mean, there's a bunch of songs about it, about how God's the judge and, you know, mercy pleaded my case. Amazing, you know, called his witness God's amazing grace. Right, how father looked at the son and the son said, that's my child. You know what that whole situation is? That's when the devil shows up. God looks in the book. What book? Well, it's that book over in Revelation where everybody thinks that their name's written. And they're searching the pages of it looking for their own name. Well, in that book, if you're saved, you got a name. I don't know that it's a name that you call yourself down here, but God's got a name for you, and it's written down in it. So when the devil shows up and says, he's done this, that, and the other, Father looks at the son, and the son shows him the nail scar prints in his hand. 
And the father looks in the book and says, I don't know what you're talking about. Means nothing can undo it. Okay, well, verse number one of chapter number five. Yeah, I know that took more than five minutes, but that's where I've been all week. Okay? We had to do all that to get to this. Therefore, being justified by faith. Again, what caused righteousness to be imputed unto Abraham? Faith. He was fully persuaded. What caused justification to be given to you? Your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just that he was, not just that he could, but that you needed him to be your savior and that he would save you because he promised. You believe that he was born of a virgin, crucified. Verse number one tells us for, or verse number 25 tells us for our offenses so that we could receive justification and that God raised him from the dead. That he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. But that you believe that Jesus did all that just to justify you and then you believe that he would save you if you asked him. Because he promised that he would. Well, verse number 20, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know why Abraham had peace with God? What? not because Abraham was special. It's because God imputed righteousness unto him. Abraham had peace with God because Abraham believed God. And God ascribed to him or attached to him righteousness because of that faith. Do you know why we today in this dispens the dispensation of grace, you know why we have peace with God? It's not because of anything you've done before or after you got saved. The very existence of sin in this sin-cursed flesh makes my flesh the enemy of God. You know what that means? It needs to be destroyed. One of these days it's going back to the ground. It will be. And then one day that ground's going to be burned up with a fervent heat. Well, if I, being the child of God, inwardly was justified, but outwardly the sin-cursed flesh could not be justified because it has to go back to the sin-cursed earth that it came from, right? how could I be at peace with God when I'm not at peace with myself? Just because... I've been made into a new creature. This sin-cursed flesh didn't get turned, changed into anything. It's still as much the enemy of God today as it was the day that I was born. Right? Conceived in sin, born in sin, made a sinner by practice and by trade. And enjoyed doing it. Guess what your flesh still likes, and do, still likes doing and enjoying? Sin. You know that part of you that the Apostle Paul talked about that there were days that he didn't do the things that he wanted to and on other days he did do the things that he didn't want to do? You know what he was talking about? The struggle between your flesh and the new creature, your spirit. Right? You really think this when on one of them days if you ever need a humility check when you think, man, I did pretty good today. Remember that every fiber of your fleshly body hates the things of God and wants to get your spirit as far away from God as it possibly can. The Bible says your heart's deceitfully wicked and no man can know it. But we don't have peace with God because we're something special. No, one day we will be something special, but that's because we're going to be exact copies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Join heirs to the throne. But what am I down here? I'm um, saved by grace. I've had justification given unto me and I've had righteous imputed, righteousness imputed unto me. I have peace with God because God stamped something to me that said, this is the New Testament calls it, robes us in his righteousness. He made a part of me the image of his son so that when he looks at me, he doesn't see me, he sees his son. Because if he saw me, he'd still see my sin-cursed flesh and he wouldn't be accepting of it. Even though inwardly, Man looketh on the outward appearance, God looketh on the heart. Knowing that I was still a sinner, but knowing that I was saved, there God be torn. Right? He loves the soul. What's he hate? Sin. Guess what this flesh is? It's sin incarnate. Everything about it wants to sin. As often as it can, as much as it can. Why? Because that's its nature. Now am I making excuses for people to sin? No. 
Because the book of Revelation said that he made his kings and priests, the kings, to rule and reign over this flesh. They promised that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. But I also understand we're not perfect. God understood that. That's why you don't have to go get saved again every time that you sin. Because God imputed unto you righteousness and justification the day that you believed. Not because you were special, but because you had enough sense. And really, you didn't have enough sense on your own. God had to give you the measure of faith that it took to believe in Jesus. He had to give you the tool to use enough common sense that, well, who wouldn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ after hearing what He did for me? He gave you that ability so that you could. So even when you think, well, the reason I have righteousness and justification is because I asked Jesus to save me. No, the reason you have it is because He did the whole work of salvation, then gave you the means to believe upon the work that He did, and then He did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. You know what that tells me? I did very little. I did the thing that anybody with common sense that God puts under conviction, right, shows them that they're a sinner, well, who wouldn't want to be saved? That just makes sense. I didn't do anything special. You know what? I did the same thing that millions and billions of people have done since all the way back to the dawn of time. They've been using faith. Not because they had any more of it than us. Again, God's no respecter of person. He gave you the same measure of faith that every other person that's ever been born has had. You know how much faith he gave you? Enough to believe like Abraham did. Enough to believe like Noah did. Enough to believe. Go, book of Hebrews, read the chapter on the hall, of, the hall of Faith. All those that had great faith. That faith was the mechanism to where we have what in verse number one? Peace with God. You know what peace means? Peace brings about prosperity. You're not going to grow if you're fighting all the time and neglecting your vineyard. And that what the Shunammite woman told King Solomon, why she thought she was unworthy? Because she attended others' vineyards, but she had not kept her own. That she labored with her hands is why she said she was black. She was sun tan. Right back then, if you worked out in the field, you had to tan. It was a sign that you were of a lower class. Because the bigwigs sat inside all day. They were carried around in seats that had pole bearers. That when they walked around town, guess what was over top of them? A canopy. Right? It was a sign of the fact that they had a privileged lifestyle. Well, she's saying, I'm as tan as can be. She said, I'm so, I've been laboring so long, I'm black. She's saying, I'm as dark as I can get. Right? Well, that's what some of you all thought when God said he wanted to save you. Lord, I'm too wicked. That can't be for me. He said... And go read what Solomon thought about the shooting might make. God thinks that times so many more about you. Why? Because God is love. And the Bible says he loved you with an everlasting love. Right? Well, that kind of faith. That's what he gave you. Because that's what he gave to them. Now you've got to exercise faith. Uh, well, if we were to... I don't like using this example. It brings up bad memories. If we were to put a big old weight rack right there, okay, and we were to give you a squat rack, that brings up real bad memories. I got back problems now because of that nonsense. Right, but we give you a 45-pound bar. You start off, right, you got to get the form right. Believing takes a little bit of, you know, precision. Can't just go out and say, well, I believe. Now, in order to believe, you've got to conquer your unbelief. Right? Before you can ever start lifting any weights, you've got to start believing the right way. But what that woman that came to Jesus say, Lord, I believe, but help mine unbelief. You know what? She understood Jesus was enough, and she wasn't, and Jesus could help her with her unbelief. Why do you think he gave you so many promises? Why do you think he gave you so many assurances? So many in samples from Old and New Testament on how he's exceedingly able to do above all we can ask or think. So if he promised it, he's going to do it. 
You know what he asked you to believe? The same thing that Abraham believed. That if God said he would, that God can. Regardless of what happens to us in the meantime, if God said it, it's going to happen. Here's how much Abraham believed it. Abraham didn't even have to... He believed he was going to find the city, but he was okay if his descendants found the city and he never saw it. He didn't make God promise him that Abraham would see that city in his lifetime. Abraham still went looking for it. He believed that God would do it in God's timing with no strings attached. And we've got more than he got because we got the earnest of the Holy Spirit. We've got God living in us to also bear witness to what the Word said, which is what? That if God promised it, God would do it. Right now, all that being said, last week I said, faith pretty important. Can't say it's the most important thing, but it's pretty important because without it, it's impossible to please God. Right? Well, at the same time, this week we find out faith, very important. Why? Because, because of your faith, using the faith that God gave you, he imputed righteousness and justified you because you believe that Jesus did what he wrote that he did and preserved for 2,000 years for you to read it. And then you believe that not only he did it, but that he would do for you what he promised he would. So you asked him to save you, fully persuaded that he would. And you know what happened as a result? He saved you. Okay, well, now we have peace. That's afterwards. Okay? Verse number one. Therefore, being justified. Okay, that, that's past tense. I was justified and still am today. That's what being means. Okay? By faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Have, currently. Because I was and still am, I have peace. You know what keeps you in a state where you have peace with God? Your faith. You know what the peace of God brings? Read verse number 2. By whom, talking about Jesus Christ, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know why God blesses certain people? Because they're at peace with Him. Did He not say in verse number 2? By, by whom? Talking about Jesus. Because of our faith and He saved us. Because of Jesus and him attaching his righteousness and justification to us. We now have access to, by faith, into this grace. Now we know that for by grace were you saved through faith. But through faith you have access to grace. What do you say? The two go hand in hand. You show some... Show me somebody that stands up and says, well, I just don't experience, you know, a lot of the grace of God. One, you're lying, because daily he loads us with benefits. But two, if you think that you're being shortchanged on grace, why don't you try believing a little bit more? You saying that's prosperity doctrine, Brother Jordan? No. He said, into this grace. What is this grace? The grace of God. The grace of God's a whole lot more than bestowing things. Right? Because you're at peace with God, you get access to the goods of God. God doesn't share His goods with His enemies. God doesn't give out His best to those that want to go out and live exactly the opposite of what He's turned us into. Now, does He still see our righteousness? Yeah, but He knows that righteousness doesn't belong in certain places. He knows that righteousness doesn't hang around with certain kinds of people. Now granted, Jesus was the friend of publicans and sinners, but he didn't live with them. He didn't walk like them. didn't talk like them. Jesus was in the world, but was not of this world. Well, what are we? We're pilgrims. That means we're here, but we're headed somewhere else. We're supposed, the Bible still says we're supposed to be ye separate. Right? We're in it, but not of it. I can walk past it and it's not going to get attached to me because I'm not of this place. Right? 
If you walk through Walmart, you can walk past all the clothes you want. They're not going to jump off and put themselves on you. Why? Because that's not of you. And you're not of it. You would have to make the choice to go out and grab it and make it a part of you. To put it on. So God knows, even though he's imputed righteousness unto us, he knows when righteousness isn't all that righteousness can be. Because he still sees his son, and his son's perfect. But he also knows his son wouldn't go certain places. And he knows his son wouldn't do certain things. The Bible says he knows the thoughts, or the intents of your heart, your very thoughts. Well, how do we have peace? Believing. Well, believing what? Believing that I'm not enough, but he's enough to make me into what I ought to be. We're not going to get finished with all this, so let's just take this. David, when he stood before Saul, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the armies of the living God? He says, how come one of y'all ain't been down there and whipped this dude yet? Right? I've been here for 15 minutes, or however long it was, and I've already had enough of him cussing God. How come you all haven't had enough of him cussing God? That he stands there and defies the armies of the living God. You know what that means? He was saying in a whole lot of words and not so nicely that he didn't believe God was real. And David said, that makes me angry. Now, even though it hadn't been written yet, David knew there's a difference between being angry and being angry and sinning. David was angry and he sinned not. What did he do? He was filled with indignation. Same thing that the Bible says Jesus was filled with when he drove the money changers out of the temple with the three-quarter whip that he made. Did he do it out of anger and hatred? No, he did it with righteous indignation. It was the right thing to do and nobody else was going to do it, so he did it. And he did it in a way that he knew would work. So what did David do? He said, I know God can kill that sucker. He said, you know why I know God can kill that sucker? Because I tend to my father's sheep. And out in the field, God delivered a lion and a bear into my hand. You know what that means? That sling of his had loosed a rock that killed a lion and a bear before. Now, you know what that tells me? Long before he ever saw Goliath, David believed that when he was out there with his father's sheep, God was bigger than anything he was going to run across. And knowing that, David also understood he had a responsibility that in order for the sheep to get taken, he had to get taken first. Because the shepherd would give his life for the sheep. That's what ours did. That's why he's the great shepherd and the chief shepherd. So, David understood God's able to deliver it. But even if, God still expects me to do what I can. And you know what he said? I can't put on Saul's armor. I can't carry Saul's sword. He said, I haven't proved them. He said, I've never practiced with them. I've never become proficient with them. Long before David took the sheep out in the field, you know what he was doing? He knew that it'd be expected for him to protect the sheep. And Samuel, who came to anoint him, he said when he looked at him, he was the least of all of Jesse's children. He said, that one? God said, Man look at on the out. God looks on the heart. He said, that one. He said, okay. But you know what was in David's heart? No matter what came his way, he is going to be prepared to do everything he could to get out of God's way. David didn't just say, well, I believe God's going to kill a bear or a lion if I come across it and not take his sling and stone with him. You know what David needed? David believed that God could, but he also believed that God expected some action on our part. Real faith has feet. You know why those that believe have peace with God? Because they live the way that God, they know God expects them to. 
You know why David had sling and a stone the day that he went to go see his brothers and deliver them food? Because he knew there might be danger on the road between where he was and where the armies were. And he knew God was bigger than anything he ran across. But he also knew that if he ran across something, he had enough faith that God could use whatever he had in that sling and use it to kill whatever it was on the other side. You say, it's just a rock. Yeah. Just a rock that sunk into somebody's forehead. What wasn't about the rock and it wasn't about the sling is all the faith behind that rock. I believe, it's just me, I believe David is a good enough shot. Whether it killed Goliath or not, he's going to hit him right here. Because he said that he hadn't proved Saul's army. You know what that means? He had proved the slingshot. You know what? He had proved that he can hit anything with that rock. But he also knew, I can't kill that sucker unless God's in it. You know what it takes to kill a bear nowadays? You got to go buy one of them Smith & Wesson 500 Magnums that's got bullets this big in it. That's what they carry around in Alaska because they got Kodiak bears that if they look at you, you're going to die. Right? Let alone if it charges at you. And he had a slingshot. But he said, Lord, I'm going to put this rock right where you need it to be. Now, did God need the rock to be there? No. God could called. God made the bear. Could have told the bear to die. Could have told the bear to disappear. Could turn the bear into a tree. God can do whatever God wants to do. But David said, Lord, I know that you expect me to be the best that I can be. So I'm going to put this right between that bear's eyes. Lord, I believe, not because I'm strong enough, not because the rock's hard enough, but because I believe that you've got me in your hand and I've got all these sheep in my hand that you're going to take care of the sheep because you promised to take care of me. But what happened? The bear died. Now, did David say, I killed the bear because God allowed it? No. He said, God delivered the bear and the lion into my hand. You know what that tells me? David knew the sling wasn't enough to kill the bear, but it did anyway. Why? Because David couldn't swing a sword around. David couldn't take up a pole arm or a spear and charge at the bear. David knew he wasn't strong enough, wasn't quick enough, wasn't able enough to kill the bear. But he said, Lord, I believe that you're able to keep me because I'm yours. So, Lord, I'm going to do what I can, and it's not much. But you know what God did with that little bit? He delivered a bear and a lion into his hand. Then he delivered a whole kingdom upon his shoulders. Then, because of David's how much did David believe God is a man after God's own heart? That ever been said about you? You say, well, you had a great sin. I know. But guess what? The Bible said he's still a man after God's own heart. Before and after. You know what that tells me? David believed God. How much did he believe God? Without doubt. Fully persuaded. And he was fully persuaded he couldn't kill a bear, he couldn't kill a lion, and he couldn't kill Goliath. You know how I know that that's the case? Because he knew that if he hit him, Goliath wasn't dead. What'd he do after Goliath fell? He went and took Goliath's own sword and cut his head off. I believe Goliath was dead as soon as that thing sunk its way into his head. But David knew he had to do what he could. You know what happened after the bear hit the ground and the lion hit the ground? He went over and slit its throat to make sure. Where are you going with this, Brother Jordan? If you believe God... You know how you're going to live? Fully equipped, fully prepared. That if God tells you to do it, you're going to do it, regardless of what it is and regardless of what you got to do in order to do it. Why? Because I've seen what fully persuaded looks like in the Word of God, and it does what God says whenever God says it, however God says it. We heard about all them people that heard from God once and then went and did what God told them to do for hundreds of years without ever hearing confirmation of it again, or without ever God showing up, patting them on the back and saying, hey, you're doing a good job today. You know why they were in the... They knew they were in the perfect will of God. You know why that was? Because they had peace with God. And because of that peace, they knew that they were... Not because they deserved it, but that they would be recipients of God's... They entered into 
the grace of God. If you're in the grace of God, you ain't, nothing you can do can keep you from getting blessed because you're in the smack dab middle of God's grace. What do you say? Nowadays, Noah heard from God once. 120 years, he went and preached what God told him to other people. He didn't just believe enough to do it. He believed it enough that he thought them people were going to die unless they got in the boat he was building. Even though he didn't know how to make a boat, but he just decided that even if he made the boat wrong, God promised that if he made a boat, that it would float. That made me sound like Johnny Cochran. But that rhymed. I don't know that the ark was seaworthy. I don't know that the ark was able to keep water out and air in. But I believe Noah built it to the best of his ability the way that God said to build it. And I believe even if it wasn't seaworthy, God made the thing float because he promised that it would. I got a boat with no roof on it. It says that he had a cover on it. But how's it going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights and that cover not give out? Enough rain fell down to cover the whole earth. So much so that it took 40 days and 40 nights for the water to just disappear. And then it took about another three months for the mud to dry out enough to where you could walk on it. You're telling me that much water fell on top of the boat and none got in? They didn't have flex tape back in the day. Okay, There would have been leaks. I don't care how good of a sewer or a seamstress you are. Make something out of leather that's just held together by string that's not going to leak when a whole bunch of water gets on it. When you've never made a boat cover before. What are you saying? Water didn't get in because God said water wasn't going to get in. Not because Noah knew how to build a boat. You know why Goliath died? Because God honored the faith. And the fact that David had a backbone thicker than any of them in there that day. To stand up and say, no, my God is real. And because he's real, he's going to deliver you into my hand. Not because I'm something special, but because he's God and you're sitting there defying him to everybody's face. You know what faith will cause you to do if you're fully persuaded? Go out after you hear it once. How many times do you think Noah would have read his Bible a day if he had one? How often we believe? How often we read ours? He was fully persuaded that the Word of God was enough to hang 120 years on and the rest of his life after that. Yet we come to church three times a week here preaching out of the same Bible written by the same God that told Noah and told Abraham and told everybody else all the things that we read about and yet we walk out thinking, man, I wish he'd stop preaching on that. Well, how about you just believe that God wants you to do it and go out and do it? Some of y'all's faces still turn purple. Get so angry when he mentions the word Facebook or phone. Now you say, but Jordan, do you not use your phone? No, I use my phone all the time. But when God says put it away, I put it away. Why? Because I believe he's got something better for me. God never tells you to put something down unless he's getting ready to tell you to pick something else up that's better. I know you can do a lot of good on a phone. But if you instill the belief into your children that that stupid thing that's about this big and has to get recharged every night, yeah, if it's so amazing, how come it, the battery doesn't last longer? Anyway. But if you instill it into your children, that thing is dangerous. Now, we'll say this and we'll be done. We'll be, if there's any liberals left either on live stream or in here, this will set them off. You know why some people can handle a gun and not kill anybody with it on accident? Because they were taught that thing's dangerous. When you pick that thing up, I don't care if it doesn't have a magazine in it. You check and see if it's loaded. You make sure that it's not loaded. And even when you know that it's not loaded, don't point it at anything that you don't want a bullet to go through. And then even when you do point it at something that you want a bullet to go through, know what's on the other side of it. Because that bullet's going to be moving real quick. There's a good chance it might go through something and into another. You know why people that believe those things are X amount of times less likely to kill themselves in an accident, to have one of their children kill somebody in an accident or themselves in an accident? 
because they instilled into them a belief that they are fully persuaded that thing can be fun but it's also very dangerous well how dangerous is it it could ruin your life even if you don't do damage to yourself you can end up behind bars for the rest of your life because of one silly stupid decision and that cell phone's the same way not just for the youngins you can make a mess of your life in 15 minutes or less and such a mess that only God could do anything to fix it he said what are you saying brother Jordan some people are just fully persuaded that what God says is true they believe it enough to not just live on it but to live to the best that they can live may not be much but they understand that God saved them for a reason and they want to be all they can be if you enjoyed today's message head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons and don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast as always thanks for listening